Hi, this is Scott Bradfield. Welcome to the bathtub. And uh, today we're going to uh, talk about one of my favorite books. I haven't read it in a couple of decades. At least Nine Stories by J.D. Salinger. Uh, the premise this week is uh, after reading one of these kind of difficult books or one that takes so much attention over several several days, such as uh, Vineland by Pynchon. I'm trying to read if, uh, at least two or three books that, uh, you know, I don't, they kind of just fly by and they and they just read quickly and they, that that doesn't mean they're any less significant or enjoyable than uh, than uh, Vineland, but uh, they just kind of they're effortless. They just kind of they're perfect for the bathtub. Uh, Nine Stories is perfect for the bathtub. It's also one of the books that I'm always trying to get my students to read and my my creative writing students. One of the things I I feel as a teacher of creative writing for many decades is that uh, I, I'm trying to show my students the obvious. I don't know much. I'm not a particularly clever person. And uh, I, uh, I'm i just trying to get them to see this, the basics, techniques of fiction. And the mas it's like a master class in short story writing from Salinger. So you have the, the kind of specialness of Salinger is that voice and that kind of idiosyncratic and kind of comic and cynical look at the world uh, and the way people are pretentious. There's, much much like Richard Yates, another writer I like, both Yates and 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 Salinger have a have have a good kind of cold eye for the the ridiculousnesses of our behavior and our kind of pretentiousness and the way we say things and maybe mean something else. And he always can get those nice little objective moments and those great little lines of dialogue. We can hear the voices of what the characters say, and when they say something, we can hear what they're thinking. The, I'll, I'll try to give you a couple of examples, but when they say something, he doesn't have to tell us what they're thinking. We can sort of imagine ourselves into that that person. Um, now, that sounds quite difficult to do. I never try to teach my students how to do that. What I try to teach them is just the basics of how to start and conclude a story. And almost all of the, well, all the short stories in this book do all the stuff you're supposed to do. Almost all of them, except for Teddy. That, which I find a really annoying story every time I read it, uh, except for the concluding story in which Salinger tries to explore Vedantic uh, Buddhist thought or reincarnation or I don't know what's going. It's it's a it's an annoying story, but even when the story is a bit annoying and the and the the thoughts that Salinger is trying to present are a little annoying, he still does everything technically right. So let's just look at a few things briefly this week. I'll start with the opening story, the most famous story in the book, A Perfect Day for Banana Fish. I'm going to avoid trying to spoil any of these stories about what happens at the end. So let's just look at the opening. And I'm always trying to get my students to do this stuff. Uh, mo most often, Stur uh, Salinger is pretty far back from his characters. So we're often not in their heads. And we're often observing them. But the point of view is very consistent usually throughout the story. And then he does all the normal things, which is when he shifts point of view, he usually breaks the scene and starts a new scene. That's the most normal way of doing things. Again, it's no-brainer stuff. Uh, you just have to stop getting all wound up about uh, all these clever ideas you have and just do the, mas the basic job. The opening line, the opening paragraph is worth reading. There were 97 New York advertising men in the hotel and the way they were monopolizing the long-distance lines, the girl in 507 had to wait from noon till almost 2.30 to get her call through. Again, where's the story start? I'm always asking my students, where's your story start? And we know when the story starts. It's after the day waiting, and we got the phone call through. You get to listen to a sentence like that, and that that's 90% of what you have to do in a, in a short story, to start it somewhere. And... We know when it's starting, and we know who we're with. We're with the girl, something I often get annoyed with my students. They say the girl, the man. But with, with Salinger, he's going to very quickly give us a specificity about this girl. He's going to give us a good idea of who she is very quickly. Watch out quickly. And he, he really is staying way back. So the fact that we don't know her name makes sense because we're not really in her head. So much as almost his movie camera behind her. Now, even though she's the girl, look how much he gives us in the first paragraph. Uh, while she's waiting for the call. She used the time, though. She read an article in a women's pocket-sized magazine called Sex is Fun or Hell. 
She washed her comb and brush. She took the spot out of the skirt of her beige suit. She moved the button on her sax blouse. She tweezed out two freshly surfaced hairs on her mole. When the operator finally rang her room, she was sitting on the window seat and almost finished putting lacquer on the nails of her left hand. One clear objective action after another. Not lots of details. We don't have Updikean details and sort of richness of, and clarity of colors and shadow and all the stuff that someone like Updike might be able to do. But we've got one nice clear event. And each one has, you know, again, even the magazine title or the lacquer on her hand, her fingernails. Each one gives us an image, and we're not being explained anything, all visual images. Um, I, I don't want to go too much further. We have a nice opening scene, and again, once we get the scene started, we, spend, we know when we are, and we have a telephone conversation between the girl and her mother, which is a terrific, very funny. He's very funny scene. Salinger's kind of a the master of getting a two-person conversation going and the way people talk to each other and the comedy of the way people talk to each other. Um, almost entire Tia Franny and Zoe is just two people talking. Uh, again, the story shifts point of view. I, I don't want to describe any more than that, but even when, she, when he shifts point of view, he does the same thing with each of his characters. So we don't really get inside their heads, which is a smart idea. Most, most good writers are, are wary of trying to get inside the character's head. Okay, there's a, the worst, the most useless term in reading or writing fiction is stream of consciousness. This has destroyed so many people. They think they're supposed to give us everything someone's thinking. Any smart writer knows that thinking, the way a character thinks, is like quicksand. And Salinger stays out of it as much as he can, and he would prefer to have people tell you what they're thinking than try to describe what they're thinking. And because when they tell you what they're thinking, we realize they're trying to put together this thing you can't quite understand. And they put it in the words, and we see around the words. We're always seeing around the characters and seeing around the words of the characters in Salinger. And that's just because he listens to them. He listens to them and he lets them listen to each other. Very simple. Sets up the scene, concludes the scene. Show, again, there's a master class. You just go through this book and just learn all the basics. Um, here's another one. Just before the war with the Eskimos, first paragraph, we know we're in the point of view of this girl who's playing tennis with a friend, Ginny Maddox. And as Ginny's going home with a friend of hers to, their, to, to the friend's house in a cab, there's a little bit here, just a very small bit, but I just keep wanting, I would love to just put this on the wall of all my students' offices. Uh, top of page 40, and Ginny says, hey, Selena. What? asked Selena, who was busy feeling the floor of the cab with her hand. I can't find the cover to my racket, she moaned. Now, every time I see that line, the, the, we speak to Selena, and then we see her feeling the carpet. Because that's all we know. We're looking at her, and we're feeling the carpet. All of my students would say, Selena was trying to find her tennis racket. You know, Again, I just that, that's the type of thing will drive me up the wall. She's feeling the carpet. We're watching her feel the carpet. Any normal person has no idea why she's feeling the carpet. And then she tells us, where's my damn uh, cover to my racket? So th those are, again, time is right in there. We're seeing the visual visualizations of what, what, what Ginny sees. And, th and that happens in sequence. It's, fiction is not rocket science. It's pretty goddamn simple. There's a number of ways we do this. Um, pretty Mouth and Green My Eyes. Again, you can read these totally with pleasure, but you will see these major signposts of fictional technique almost in every paragraph. Pretty Mouth and Green My Eyes is a lovely little story where we're just, again, we're on one side of a phone conversation. We're with a gray-haired man again. We can get away with it because we're so far out of his head. And then we don't break the frame. So we stay with the gray-haired man all through the story. And the fact that we don't aren't privy to his thoughts and we aren't privy to all the information of the story. And this is the other point. Salinger doesn't give us any more information than we need to know. When we're with the girl at the beginning of Banana Fish, we're with her. The mother calls. Then we go to Seymour. We're not being told their history and explained everything. But we're having nice dramatic scenes with interesting dialogue of characters who we like to hear talk. 
you need to if you find some characters that are worth listening to talk, that's 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 the battle, not explaining all the stuff you want to explain. So he's always making sure he doesn't do that. Pretty my mouth, pretty mouth and green my eyes is a nice little ex, uh, experiment in just living within the frame of that point of view. So we don't know at the end exactly what happens. There's two or three things that could be happening at the end of the story. But once we get the information by overhearing the dialogue, because that's all we're privileged to, then we are participants in the scene. We're listening to the scene and we're making up our own minds. But ultimately, those two people are interesting enough to listen to. When we overhear people on a bus, we don't need to know everything they're talking about, who they are, where they come from, or why they're talking. But if they're interesting, we'll listen. Uh, the story, uh, one of my students had mentioned how much he loved De, De, Damier, De Damier Smith's Blue Period. And I just reread this this morning. I forgot this story completely, and I love this story. And it's kind of the last great Salinger short story, I think, sequentially. I think Teddy comes after, and that's when he really starts to get overly obsessed and overly self-conscious about what he's, whether he's bringing important information to his readers and he's... A lot of things happen to Salinger. And I recommend the Slo Slowuski, I think it's Slowuski biography that just came out. I enjoyed reading that. To Damier, to Damier Smith's Blue Period, I don't want to set it up too much, but it's about a kid. He's he's an artist. Uh, he's He's got a little Holden Caulfield in him, but he's very different. He's a much more disciplined person than Holden. And he uh, decides to pretend he's French. He's a French artist, and he gets a job in somewhere in Montreal, I think, or up in Canada, where he's working for a mail, uh, an, uh, a college by mail, an education by mail art school, where they take people's art. I mean, they used to have these on matchbook covers when I was a kid. Can you draw this lumberjack on the matchbook? And you would draw some stick figure and send it in. They'd say, oh, well, we'll teach you art. And he's sort of working for a couple of Japanese, an elderly Japanese couple, and the scenes that he does between him and these two, where he's pretending he's talking French and he's friends of Picasso, and these people look at him and they really aren't interested. It's it's there's a very good chance that they just don't even know who Picasso is when he's talking to them. And it, they're there's lovely little scenes. But the center of the story is that there's he's a kid who's kind of interested in art, but a bit of a bullshit artist. And he gets these students, and most of their stuff is awful. And he gets a painting by a nun. And he really, and they're religious paintings, and they sound kind of crazy, but there's something in them that really moves him, and he really tries to help her. Um, and near the end of the story, I want to just read a couple of things, a little passage here. And of course, what have I done? I've lost the page number. Oh, here it is. Um, it's on page 157. Just one last example of this, this kind of technique of, of uh, Salinger's. Uh, Baba 156, he start, he's talking about his day working with these students. He says, Thursday mid-afternoon, feeling good and jumpy, I started in on one of the two new students, an American from Bangor, Maine, who said in his questionnaire with wordy, honest John integrity that he was his own favorite artist. He referred to himself as a realist abstractionist. There's two sentences, and he describes this new character, this new student, never says another word. And I see this character, I can see the narrator's opinion of this character of a realist ex ex abstractionist. And he doesn't have to explain anything. He just picks just the right details from this person's letter to let us know the guy's a total bullshit artist, kind of like the narrator. Uh, as it moves along, there's a lovely little moment here. And again, we're first person. He does this in, in Catch on the Ride, too. Even when we're doing first person with the characters, he's he rarely tries to explain emotions. He almost, he almost always tries to recall events and see things and recall voices because describing emotions is impossible. And there's a little passage here where he comes to a realization when he comes home. And this is, I won't tell you the whole plot, but... Uh, 157, uh, he says, I'm tempted to say that Thursday evening was peculiar, or perhaps macabre, but the fact is I have no 
bill-filling adjectives for Thursday evening. I left Les Amis, that's the school he teaches at, after dinner, and when I don't know where, perhaps to a movie, perhaps for just a long walk. I can't remember. And for once, my diary for 1939 lets me down, too, for that page, for the page I need is a total blank. So he's letting us know this is a significant moment in his life. I know, though, why the page is a blank. As I was returning from wherever I'd spent the evening, and I do remember that it was after dark, I stopped on the sidewalk outside the school and looked into the lighted display window of the orthopedic appliances shop. Then something altogether hideous happened. The thought was forced on me that no matter how coolly or sensibly or gracefully I might one day learn to live my life, I would always, at best, be a visitor in a garden of enamel urinals and bedpans with a sightless, wooden dummy deity standing by in a marked down rupture truss. Now, you know, it's just such a lovely moment. He doesn't try to explain the fact that the kid feels like an imposter and all these feelings. He takes that image of looking at this orthopedic shop next to the school he teaches at, and he just gives us a vision of the window. You know, it's a really, any good writer is going to try to do that. Get out of the damn head, get in a narrative moment, and see something interesting. And when he looks at this, you know, this, this the, the dummy, the window dummy and the rupture truss, you know, we bring so much to that scene, but it's because he gives us an image and he places us in that scene. And, and Salinger does that all the time in these early books. It's a shame whatever the, the, the experiences, he clearly had some really difficult experiences in the war that kind of just, just destroyed his nerves. And it seems like he's a man who actually just had a lot of trouble just dealing with the, the trauma of being in some of the worst fighting in World War II. And he, but he's still all through it all, despite uh, despite many of the ways people talked about him being a loner and isolated and kind of cranky. He seems like he was basically a good person who worked pretty hard at writing, and he was very good at writing. And, and, and you can't do worse. If you want to learn how to write fiction... Uh, to then reading nine stories. And you should even read Teddy, but it's just an annoying story. Okay, uh, we might do one more week of light stuff, I don't know, before we do heavy heavy lifting. Uh, and we'll see you soon. Uh, at, I'll see, we'll see you in the bathtub. Bye.